morning, Light Talkers. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and you're listening to Light Talk. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas, and today we're going to talk about everything from women in lighting to limelight on Light Talk. And this is Anne from San Clemente. And this is David in beautiful Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk. And we are the Lumen Brothers. And sister. And sister. Hey, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> we're all here. That's right. Uh, we're welcoming Anne back to the show. Thank you for joining us today, Anne. Thanks for inviting me well, again. You, well, you know, we've got you know, all these people saying, hey, we're tired of listening to three old white guys. It's about time we put Anne back on. And you're joining us at LDI, right? I Can sure Can you make am. it happen? Yeah, I think that's going to happen. So I will be part of uh, the portfolio reviews, which everybody should come out and do. There's a link now on the website to sign up. And then I'll be part of the Light Talk show. And then I think I'll be visiting the booth. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, would I think she's going to sign yeah, books? Yeah, I hope I hope to uh, sign uh, books. That's on. That's in the works. Apparently, I got to check in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I don't know. Are we still doing the booth? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they told us they were going to give us a booth. All I don't right, know if it's. Right. In a, I don't know if it's in a diner on the strip or it's in the conference center, but a it's a booth of good. some kind. It's, it's right next yeah. to the Elvis guy who does right next the wedding. Seinfeld and George. Well, oh, this is concerning <laughs> because if we don't have a booth. How can Anne sign books? And if she I'll sign can't, sign at the roulette table. <laughs> if she if she can't sign books, no Tesla for Anne. <gasps> oh, <laughs> that's right. All right. The, that's our grand prize, right? The Tesla. So I'm training in my vault for a Tesla. Scene. Yeah. Speaking of Teslas, <laughs> I love my Tesla. You know, I, I finally got my Tesla last month. It finally arrived. Look out, California drivers. Oh no, I've already laid my mark already in California. Yeah, they they know by. about me. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it was pretty fast. But, you know, as great as this car is, I must tell you guys something, because it's a beautiful car. It really is a stunning-looking car. And from the outside, it is really quite lovely. And the lighting is amazing. The, the headlights and all the lights outside, it's, like, really cool. But when you go inside the car, as beautiful as the interior is, the lighting really sucks. What? And I don't that's know. Su- I know. That's surprising. Neglected. I'd return it. <laughs> Well, you know, it's like they spent all this money designing this state-of-the-art car. And it is quite beautiful. I'm sure you guys have seen it. It has has this big, gigantic video screen in the middle of it. The better to distract you with, my dear. (laughs) This car drives itself. You don't really need to watch the road. Oh, no. I'm scared. (laughs) Although although it is highly (laughs) suggested that you do watch the road. But anyway, uh, but they have all these little... LED pin spots all over the place. You know, no edge lighting, no contour lighting. Oh. And they're lovely and they're, lines. Are they 5,000 Kelvin? I bet. No, they're 3,200 Kelvin. Okay, good. That's good to hear. Well, no, it's not because the interior colors of the car like a lot of grays and silvers and blacks oh. and white. Oh, so you got amber, you got, you got orange amber, light on cool exactly. material. It should be like purple actually, or something. Actually, I know why they did that. I did some research. Why? Well, I don't know if David's aware of this yet. We certainly talked about it. Have you picked up the pig for your car yet and gone to Rodeo? The pig is on order. They backed order. The pig the looks best in that uh, tungsten light world. Oh, that's why I haven't realized it. Because, yes, they do come with pigs. I have no uh, idea I, what I, you're talking about. Well, and <laughs> the way back in episode, I don't think it was like 14 or something like I'm that. I'm sure I listened. We talked about the pig option, and I got the pig option. Um, but but again, they're back ordered. So you know, I'm going to hold off my criticism until I see the pig. But I'm just telling you right now, they've spent all this money on this car, and I think the lighting has been an afterthought. And you know, this stretches out to a lot of automobile manufacturers. I must say, the only car I've ever seen that I enjoyed the interior lighting in is my old BMW. Now wait, now wait. So I had a Ford Focus electric for three years. Yeah. The interior lighting was fabulous. It's exactly what you're talking about. It's edge lighting, it's LED, and it's color changing. 
It was one. My Mini Cooper was good. I just had to sell it because the transmission went out, but it had different lighting options, so I could choose different mm-hmm. colors and things. It was fabulous. Mm-hmm. That's what Tesla yeah. needs. You know, mm-hmm. I was expecting. Why a- would Tesla not do that when Ford and Mini Cooper have Seriously, done? Seriously, I had yeah. like pink and lavender. It was fantastic. <laughs> oh, you had pink and lavender. I, I had I had pretty uh, pretty saturated saturates, but I had a blue that matched the matched the interior. I had a red, I had a green. It was under the dash. It was on the sides of the doors. It was in the door panels. It was beautiful. Ford. Ford. Let me just repeat that. Ford did that. Okay? <laughs> Ford. Well, I'm still confused by this pig thing. I'm picturing you running around with like a stuffed animal fuzzy pig in your car. <laughs> well, actually, it doesn't live inside the car. There's a harness that the pig is attached to, and it lives outside the car. What is it? I don't know. You have to ask Steve. Steve has designed this thing. I think he's expecting to make a lot of money. But, you know, why do cars look like airplanes? You know, like really mm. good commercial jets. Mm-hmm. Like, have you ever flown the old, um, what was it? It was uh, uh, Virgin America. Mm-hmm. Airpl- no, flights. I want to. I hear they're great. You walk in and it's like this. It looks like you're walking through like a bad 1970s discotheque because it's all this really deep blue light. You know, it's really dark blue light with these 5,000 uh, Kelvin LEDs spots. And, and it's like amazing. I love the, the, the interior. Of that. I, I would like spend uh, extra hundred dollars for a ticket just to get on that airplane because it's really cool. We were on a reconditioned 757 to, uh, to Maui last month and it was dark blue indigo that's ambient it. that's it right yeah and, and it was 5000 kelvin uh reading lights yeah that's it well i'm not going to talk about this now but there's a whole area of study about circadian rhythms and jet lag and how to overcome that and using light in the planes to compensate but i won't go i won't go down that rabbit hole today we need to move on to show but i'm going to end this off yeah. at just offering elon musk right now my services and I'm going to do it. Very good. I'm going to do it for, yeah. for cheap. I'll, I'll design the lighting in your car. And uh, I'll do it for love. No, I'm actually doing it for a free Tesla Roadster, which is about yeah. a $250,000 car that goes from zero to 60 in about one second. So anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, I've got the first question today. Uh, Gadwa from Morocco. Uh, Gadwa writes, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about women in the role of lighting design. Well, all I have to say about this is just in my experience of, you know, knowing lighting designers, like people like, you know, I met Theron Musser in like 1977. And of course, Gene Rosenthal, there's like started lighting design, basically. And uh, Ann, Ann Militello, Peggy Clark, Marilyn Renegal, Peggy Eisenhower, uh, Pauli Constable. And I'm going to say our own Ann McMills. I mean, there are women everywhere in lighting design. And in my opinion, I believe, and again, this is not scientific, that, uh, just from my experience, that women are a lot more sensitive to music hmm. as a whole than men are. Just my experience, and I'm sure someone's going to take issue with it, but I'm just telling you. And that is why, That's in my experience of teaching which is almost 30 years now, teaching grad students, most of my students have been women. I'm not saying for any reason I choose women, but they seem to fall into my way of teaching a little better. Of course, there are exceptions. You know, I do teach a lot of men too. But it just seems that's the way it's worked out for me. So anyway, but we have a woman on the show today. (laughs) We have Anne. I'm really curious how Anne feels about this. Here I am. Yeah, that's a that's a heavy question for this morning. Where, where do we even begin? Um, you know, like, like you said, David, I think that we have in theater, we, we're really lucky, at least in America, to have a lot of powerful women role models in, in lighting. Um, you know, I, I believe um, Polly Constable didn't talk about it on our show, but uh, in other shows, I've heard her talk about how that isn't true in England. And she's felt like a void, you know, coming up through the ranks. So it's even a different situation there. But um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a very general question. But I think that, you know, we're really well built for this business, just like our male colleagues. You know, many of us are good at multitasking and we have a good balance between right and left brain, all that sort of thing. Um, but I don't think of myself as a woman in lighting. I just think of myself as a lighting designer, you know, and I think um, the more like I'm of course, I'm in for diversity issues and I want equality and all that. But I think when you're working in the business, I don't like to think of myself as any different than anyone else. I'm just working in that profession, you know. 
And I, I don't know, I wonder, because I have a ton of women students as well. Um, you know, I, I also, like David, don't choose women specifically or something, but I feel like they're often drawn to me in my program. Um, but I think that it's becoming, at least I'm hoping, that more and more women are becoming drawn to this profession. And I think maybe prior to this, it was because there wasn't enough STEAM teaching to women, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, we weren't really taught to embrace technology and all that sort of stuff. So it, it went away from all these powerful women role models and lighting and became sort of a void where women were still, you know, we were taught to sort of decorate rather than um, work in a, a profession like lighting. So I think that's all changing with the educational system and all that. And I also think um, I've heard a lot of people talk about how there's a lot of women students in sort of earlier years, but then they drop out in when you get into the profession. And I've heard people say that's because of, you know, having a family and the issues that come along with that. But I think some of that is changing. I think employers are being more understanding. I think there's more support out there. I think there's more male colleagues that are taking the, the home role when needed or balancing that more. Um, so I think that's going to help as well. I mean, Polly Constable is a great example of this. She talked about it, you know, someone who can do it all. Check out Paulie's uh, interview with us because it is terrific. But like Ann just said, it has a lot to do with being able to balance things, right brain, left brain, and all that. But you're still, unfortunately, as Paulie uh, said, uh, there's still going to be some challenges there that have to do with out, you know, outside of talent and creativity. And that's a shame and that we should all work to you know, make it a, a more equal opportunity uh, yeah. industry. And I'm looking forward to the day that I don't have to talk to my female students about what it's like working in the industry as a woman. You know, I hate that it's, a re you know, it's 2018 and I'm still still talking about this, you know. And, you know, I have students that weren't let, uh, weren't allowed to do lighting when they were in high school or college. And I'm like, is that still going on? You know, because that happened when I was young. I wasn't allowed to do lighting, you know. And, um, so it. it saddens me that I still have to have those conversations but I also recognize when I'm having those conversations things about like how to dress how to present yourself how you have to be really on top of things or you'll be doubted you know all those sort of things that I hate talking about but I feel that it, it prepares people prepares women for the field um, I'm hoping that goes away at some point because it's it feels awful telling you know talking about those things but I also feel like I want them to know the realities out there but I think that's just changing as you know, men in this profession are amazing and getting more and more wonderful. And these, these things that, you know, it sounds like it's a male dominated profession, like that's going away, you know. So I think it's it's changing over time. We just have to we have to turn that corner. Yeah, I read this really cool article from several women lighting designers, and I, I called it up while you guys were talking because it was a particular part of it that really resonated with me. And it's not so much about the gender bias per se, but let me just read this paragraph. And I don't know if you guys, I don't know if, if you guys know Jane Cox, oh, but yeah. this is the, the, this is the one that, the, that really struck me. I'll just read this one paragraph. Cox believes a gender bias, there believes a gender bias within the discipline can be found in the way lighting design is taught in the context of the university. She sees the instruction of lighting design as a variation of set design, even though they're different art forms. The false equivalency, however, has misrepresented what lighting designers do and what lighting design is. And then in quotes, in order for lighting designers to get equal pay in their field, they've had to make the case that lighting is important as set design, end quote, she explained. In order to make that case, people have said that you have to have the same skills as set designers in terms of the narrative <laughs> This is the part that got me in terms of the narrative framework or conceptual setup of the piece. That's not really what lighting designers do, but we try to sell it like that's because that's what men do. Whereas if you say what lighting design really is, which is a kind of emotional, intuitive response to other people's ideas, it starts to sound very feminine. And if you pitch it that way, you get paid less. And I thought that was really an interesting insight into it's true. Think about how most of our production meetings start yes. with the set, mm -hmm. right? And, and that the lighting comes later, but but it's a different... It, she's absolutely honed in on something that I think is a, a very astute observation. That's not necessarily about gender bias, but it is about bias towards lighting mm -hmm. design. And perhaps maybe the next step of that is that maybe women or, a, or somebody with a feminine side actually makes a really good lighting designer, but it is more intuitive. It is more um, emotional, than, than perhaps that 
locking in on the narrative. And I think she makes a really great point. God, there. she's brilliant because, you know, she in is. these classes, you know, we have, we, I teach a grad program just like all of you. And in these classes, we're always trying to fit lighting into this box. Like, okay, mm-hmm. now we present prelims. What the heck does that mean for lighting? Okay, let's make mm-hmm, some renderings. Mm-hmm. Okay, now let's talk about concept. You know, there's all these things that it's mm-hmm. like, it's just so, it's, it's not even the same box as the other ones. And we're always trying to fit that, it in that box. Well, let's change well, and it. I saw, we uh, should change it. Well, we should. And yeah. I think her point, her point is so succinctly explained and so right on target. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it's all about music with me. It goes right into emotion, like Stan said, mm-hmm. and music. And, and it's not about putting it in a box. A, a lot of times, you know, I know we could pre-vis nowadays, but, you know, lighting sketches before pre-vis, they're not very accurate. And really, they're not very useful when you think about it. Because just lighting is... convey an, an idea and a mood. A, a yeah. moment, a little moment of mood. But as we all know, lighting is a dynamic thing that changes. It mm-hmm. actually changes like music. So, you know... And with sets, there it really doesn't. <laughs> you know, I well, mean, it's, it can be, but it's 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 but not it's like really lighting. locked into the ne- it's not into the text and the narrative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and for costumes, it's really locked into the character mm-hmm. and the and the the individualness. Uh, and lighting is is really about. I always ask, what is the emotional content of that scene, and then how do we underscore that? How do we, you know, how do we use light? We just, you know, anyway. I just thought that uh, Miss Cox's oh, it's a great quote. Was worth yeah. was worth repeating. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I agree with David. Like, I think I think about sets as kind of like a concrete block. Like they're up right. there. You build them. They're steady. You know. And yes, they morph in some ways, but. Lighting is, like you said, a lot like music. I also talk about it as if it's like water, you know, so we're sort Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. light is flowing around the the stage and we've got these sort of puddles of light in different places. And it's it's very um, touchy feely, which does come across very feminine. You know, you made me think of Jean Rosenthal's great quote about uh, dance lighting. And she said, I repeat this a lot. Dances are in light. As fish are in water. Ooh, just to emphasize I love that. Your, your water metaphor. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> it is yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So uh, Godwa, who wrote us, I think it's I think it's a very large topic and we've barely t- touched on it, but I think we just all keep, you know, putting in our, our best foot forward in front of the next best foot forward, and I think at some point we will stop having these conversations, which will be a nice day. <laughs> well, you know, we thought we cured it all in the sixties. <laughs> yeah. No, the dent, just the dent. When we elected just... Obama president, we thought that we were now in a post-racial world, <sighs> and now we're back to the fifties. Yeah, it just keeps ebbing and flowing, right? But it's yeah, and it's not that I don't, I I want to have these conversations while it's an issue. I'm just looking forward to the time that we never even think about it. You know, I hope right. I see that. Well, I shouldn't have to. Yeah. yeah. Well, our next question comes from Patty in North Carolina, and she writes. What is most challenging about what you do? Well, there, there are two extremes. I've got all kinds of things that I find challenging. But the two extremes would probably be uh, staying current with technology. And the other one would be working fast and being able to adapt to a change in a rehearsal. Being able to turn that thing on a dime. So I have an idea and then I need to have a lot of other ideas as the director and the company uh, morph that piece I'm doing. I think staying calm in a tech is a big thing. Pacing yourself, uh, pulling everything together, recognizing that I'm working with a, a, a team, you know, that basic team, of course, being costume and scenery, but I'm also uh, tasked with pulling all this show together working with, uh, with the human being on stage, working with a costume, working with a set on stage. So, it, I mean, it's a day at the races if you're a lighting designer. You know, what happens, you know, what, what's challenging about this? Uh, if I'm a set designer, uh, then I'm not showing the entire world my mistakes. If I'm a costume designer, then I'm not showing you the fitting and uh, the refinement of the costume that's being developed in the costume shop. If I'm a lighting designer, I'm just hanging it all out there. You're seeing good ideas and bad ideas. You know, I was working on a show once. I turned a psych on, and it was just an incredibly bad color. 
like, <laughs> like Pepto Bismo color. And <laughs> I did, we all do we, it. Yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> Pepto Bismo. I, I, I just stood up at the. I stood up at the desk, turned around, said, "I'm very sorry. I won't do that again," and sat back down. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think a line designer. You know, you have to. You have to balance the room. You have to keep the temp- the the temperature of the uh, of the tension in check. Also, yeah. I don't know. What do you What do you guys yeah. find challenging about what you do? I think I think you're right, Steve. You sort of are the bar- barometer. I've got three points I would make. Some of them uh, amplify yours. Three words: stamina. Mm. I think you really need stamina yes. uh, to be to be a line designer, um, uh, like an athlete. You need stamina. You need diplomacy for the reasons that Steve just mentioned. You are sort of the, in that tech, I mean, everybody's looking at you. And so that the way in which you handle yourself and you and the stage manager, that diplomatic skills. And then probably I think a fundamental is uh, developing trust and maintaining trust. And that keeps the tension down. So trust is a big one. So trust, diplomacy, and stamina all are the ones. challenging things for me. <laughs> yeah, I would add to all that um, work-life balance. Just mm-hmm. in general, you know, it's um, all of us, we both teach and we design. And so it's very easy to be a workaholic. I'm certainly a natural workaholic, but I find that it goes to the extreme where I'm not paying attention to my life enough. And especially when you get into tech, forget it. You're not dieting, you're not exercising, you're not taking moments for yourself in you know, all those different things. And so um, if anyone knows the secret, let me know because I'm not so great at it. <laughs> Headspace. I'm using Headspace now. Headspace. What's that? 20 minutes a day. I'm doing a 20 right. minute meditation in Headspace. Is that an app? It's an app. And I, I was, it's so good that I bought the subscription. Oh. I waited for the 30% off. So for 60 bucks, I got it for a year. I like Calm. And, uh, it's like that. Yeah, Calm mm-hmm. is nice too. And Calm has, I, I checked out Calm, which has a female voice. Mm. And I, but I fell in love with this British guy on, <laughs> on Headspace. So what can I say? <laughs> mm. I have one word, spa, 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 <laughs> spa, spa. That's how you can do, you do it. That every, can you do it every day? Dave? Yeah. You if you, you know, if, if you're not on a 16 hour a day work call, you and can, you can afford spa. a Tesla. <laughs> yeah, I guess he can afford spa. <laughs> David can afford. I wish I could Maybe you should get some, com- can we get some comps to your spa? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, it's not my spa, but you have to find a spa, you know, and a good massage and just relax. Absolutely. I had a good you know. one in Long Beach. I haven't found one since I moved. <laughs> so uh, Meyer from Brooklyn wants to know, what is a limelight and how is it used? Well, um, I did a little research on this. So first of all, nobody's using them anymore. <laughs> so let's just say that. Uh, it, it has a couple of different meanings. There's, there's the idea of the limelight and then there's the actual physical invention. So being in the limelight is sort of being a public figure. It became to be that expression. Uh, but the actual device uh, of limelight, which was invented to get brighter illumination on stage, it was invented in the 1820s by Goldsmith Gurney, right? Goldsworth and he's Gurney. basically, that's a real name. That's a great I'm, name. I, that's, uh, Goldsworth, Goldsworthy, Goldsworthy Gurney. Oh, now, Goldsworthy. I looked him up. I thought it was Goldsmith. Goldsworthy Gurney uh, in Goldsworth. the 1820s. Gurney. So basically what, they, what they're doing, there's different people involved. There was Robert Hare as a Scottish engineer. There was a Thomas Drummond. All these people were working. And actually, ultimately, it was Michael Faraday who sort of realized it and used it for for surveying. But basically, it's taking a piece of calcium oxide, right, which is which is an element, and then heating it with an oxygen hydrogen flame to a really high temperature of about uh, two thousand five hundred and seventy degrees Celsius or four thousand six hundred and sixty two degrees Fahrenheit. You can you can imagine why if we were lighting production with limelight, there was a huge interest in finding a safer, less uh, method of creating high levels of illuminance. But so you're burning this oxyhydrogen flame against this calcium uh, oxide until it glows and it creates a bright white light. And I've been thinking about this lately because we're doing a play that takes place in the theater in the gaslight era called um, Red Velvet. And um, I've actually never seen with my own retina, limelight. So I have no, I've not experienced it directly. I certainly know what gaslight through a, through a fabric mantle looks like, um, and I know what a flame looks like, but I don't know. I've never actually visually experienced the light from limelight. Have you ever electrified a pickle? 
no. I think it's similar. <laughs> you guys should try this. You take you, you like you put like one end of a wire in one end of a pickle. It's got to be a kosher dill, by the way. And you put <laughs> is, is, other, that a, is there a lot of calcium oxide? Yeah, in the I pickle? think there's calcium oxide, but it actually glows and illuminates. And explodes sometimes, so kids don't try this at home. But go on, Stan. Interesting. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's what I know. Okay. That's what that's what I know. No, we don't use it anymore. It would be interesting to see one. There probably are places in the world. I just looked up calcium oxide. I don't see anything about pickles. Uh, <laughs> but, but, um, well, just go to the, go you know, to the refrigerator, uh, grab a pickle, cut the cord off. Grab a pickle. Cut a cord off your little task light. Just plug it in. Unplug See it what first. Happens. Unplug it, the cord before you cut yeah, it off. I've had a piece of tungsten <laughs> wire, you know. But uh, you know, it's. I would love to see one. And I would love to see what the qual. I tried to. I did in my research try to find out what the color temperature or spectral power distribution of limelight is or was, so that we could sort of think about. Because now we have all these great new technology, and how would we duplicate? Just for the just out of curiosity, not that we would use it. There's no poetry here, but just cu- just curious what limelight looked like, because I don't think anybody in our uh, that uh, that's our age has ever seen it. From what I have read, I don't think you're going to get a lot of good color rendering out of limelight. Yeah, it's like low pressure narrow. sodium looking. Is yeah, what I've read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be. No, it says it, it says it, it says when you read about it, it says a bright, brilliant. Here, here's here's the quote. From my research, the whole pier, it was used uh, for this particular effect on a clock tower uh, in, uh, in Kent. And, and the description here, it says, Limelight was first used for indoor stage illumination in Covent Garden in London in 1837. But it says this pier that was done uh, overwhelmed with a flood of beautiful white light is how it was described. Yeah, but that's coming from eyes that were looking at candles and gas. You know. That's, that's true. correct. That's Absolutely true. true. Plus, right. they were so we breathing really, you know, all that crap, you know, in their lungs, and it probably changed their entire uh, vision and perception. I want to add something cool. Uh, when I was in grad school, I interned at the Royal Opera House in London, and they called the follow spot position. They called it the limes. That's the limes, right. so the that limes. Was cool. yep. Even though you know yep. clearly it wasn't limelight anymore, it's still called the limes. Mm-hmm. Guess what? What? <laughs> you are listening to Light Talk with Steve, Stan, David, and Sister Anne, the Lumen Brothers and Sisters. And Light Talk this week is sponsored by. All the way from south of the border, it's Bad Ombre Stage Productions. Did you know the average LD is on his or her feet seventeen hours a day? You know, standing on concrete, ice, or just walking around the arena can be a chore. What to do, kittens? Well, now, Bad Ombre Stage Productions presents Manguera de Soporte para el D. <laughs> you heard me right. Support hose for the lighting designer. Manguera de Soporte are made to help control swelling in the ankles, feet, and lower legs. You need to squeeze those areas to prevent that pain and fluid from building up. They even work on cankles. Mm. They also come in Café, Negro, and Blanco. Just remember not to wear Blanco after Labor Day, gringos. <laughs> and be sure to ask for our Bagrero Medico, too. You don't have to buy those things used off eBay. <laughs> Bad Ombre Stage Productions, helping old white guys feel better. So Stan is selling a truss on eBay, right? <laughs> I'm selling my, you know, I, I had I had a little, uh, I had an operation in, in spring, and I had to wear a certain type of belt before I got the surgery, and now I don't need the belt, so I thought I'll just pop it on eBay. Did your belt come from Bad Ombre Stage Production? <laughs> of course. Where else would I get it? <laughs> well, maybe the Cheeky Rigger might have had them, too. Cheeky Rigger of Sheffield. <laughs> the cheeky the Rigger, I'm in debt to them already. The cheeky so. Rigger of Sheffield. I love it. Okay, moving on from that. <laughs> Do we have a Let's Talk About segment? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So uh, for today's Let's Talk About segment, we wanted to touch on how to say no. <laughs> how to Sometimes. say no. <laughs> Sometimes as lighting designers, we have a tough time with the director. Maybe you don't get along or you don't see eye to eye or it's just really a tough experience. So then, you know, out of some miracle, sometimes the director will call again to do another show with you. <laughs> And, you know, do you say no or not? And what do people do? So let's talk about that. Well, my question is always, you know, are you honest? Do you say like, like, it, you know, well, it wasn't a great experience last time because we didn't quite see. Like, is that honest or are you just, quote, busy? <laughs> I'm busy. I'm always busy. 
I'm usually busy. Yeah. To answer your question, Anne, no, I'm not honest. I think about <laughs> the project and I, I think, well, there's a couple things here. It's not just uh, uh, if, if you're having some kind of controversy with the director. Also, it gets back to being healthy. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. it's just too much right. work. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming at me, and I think, is it worth making this X amount of money? And mm-hmm. as you started the conversation, and I won't be able to go to the gym for three weeks, or I right. won't be able to have dinner at home with my wife. So right. I, I think it's about self-preservation, too. And uh, we're lucky because we teach, right? So right. if you're a freelancer, we, you can't say no as easily, so it's even harder. Yeah. Right. We can pick and choose what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just always curious how honest people are because it just feels like you'd burn the bridge. You'd want to be an honest person, but you'd feel like you'd burn the bridge. So I feel like most people are, quote, busy. Well, you can just say, I'm booked. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's what what, what it is. That's the busy. That's the busy part. And, and, um, you know, honesty is important, but, you know, (laughs) diplomacy is important as well. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, sure. I mean, it depends on how how honest you really want to be. I mean, someone calls you up and says, hey, uh, let's get together for a cup of coffee. What do you say? Uh, you go, oh, I can't. Mm-hmm. When really, you won't. Yeah. I yeah. will not go with you to get a cup of coffee. Oh, I can't get a cup of coffee today. Well, it's like seeing a friend's show and it sucks. And then they come up to you and say, what do you think of the show? <laughs> yeah, you know what you say? You say, oh, you did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Just no, like, no, you did it again. No, the, the, best, the best response is, oh, I found it very interesting. And that's leave it at that. <laughs> Just leave it at that. And then I would say, oh, I got to go. You know. So anyway, yeah. yeah so. so I think busy's the answer. <laughs> yeah, that's good. It's self-preservation. And you want to be nice and, and never talk bad about someone. Never, right. ever. Right. Never say, oh, God, that director is awful. I'd never work with them again. No one needs to know that. But I'll be hypocritical about this. Okay. So a, a director I don't want to work with comes up to me and says, hey, let's, let's work on this off-off Broadway show. And there's no money. And I know I'm a pain in the ass. Will you work with me? Oh, I'm, I'm just so busy. I'd love to. Uh, you know, or I'd love not to or whatever. But then that same director comes back to me and says, I have a multi-million dollar budget. I'm doing the Lady Gaga version of Hello, Dolly on Broadway. Do you, do you want to do it? <laughs> Hell yes, I want to do it. Sign me up right now. But what if the off-Broadway one makes a gajillion dollars, you know, and the other one's a flop? You, you just never You just know. roll and, the dice. You never know. And, yeah. And meanwhile, you've gone through this experience with this director again, you know. And now back to Light Talk. Jasmine from Long Beach asks, why is it important to have a right of first refusal clause in your contract? First, let's explain what right of first refusal means. The basic idea of right of first refusal is the producer of the show, if they decide to move the show, if they decide to sell the show, if they decide to co-produce the show, if they rebound to production in any way, that they must offer you the right of first refusal or the right actually to design the show again or to remount the show. They must offer it to you first before they offer it to to a different designer or whatever. And some uh, right of first refusals clauses give you the option also of having your assistant remounted or something like that. The reason why this clause exists is because there are many, many, many stories of shows starting way off Broadway, right, in some smaller um, regional theater or off Broadway, and the show moving on to Broadway or anywhere actually. And even though that you were a part of the original production team, they decide to use another lighting designer. And this is for all designers, by the way, and directors, as a, as a matter of fact. And, and, and this is what really bothers me, is because you were part of the original creative team, and you were part of putting that show together and creating that show. You're part of the team. And even though they may have another designer, a lighting designer come in, and they may design their own design, it's still you were part of that, and part of that, of that design will probably look like your design, especially if they're using the same set. Now, in all the years I have been designing uh, and all the shows I've designed, I've only had a case where I had to use the right of first refusal twice. The first time was about 20 years ago, and the second time is actually happening right now. And I'm not gonna get into the specifics of the case, but a show is moving to New York, and, um, and I was not invited to, to do the show. As a matter of fact, the entire original team wasn't invited. 
So what do you do? Well, first of all, hopefully you're in the union like I'm in the union because the union will support you on this. They have legal representation. They have all that stuff. And hopefully your union will make, make a big enough stink that either they will hire the designer or they will pay the designer off. They'll actually pay the fee or come to some sort of a agreement. Um, but unfortunately, this occurs in our business and you got to protect yourself. So I highly recommend that you put this clause in all your contracts. Have you guys, uh, and Anne, have you ever had experienced a situation like this? Thankfully, I have not, but I am, I am diligent about the right of first refusal clause in my contracts. In fact, I just went through a long negotiation on a rider just a f couple weeks ago. And when I first got the rider, it was, which if you don't know what a rider is, it's like a attachment to the original contract. So if you're a union, sometimes the theater still has a rider attached to the union cover sheet. Um, but their rider had a whole thing about um, the theater owned my designs for all remounts, tours, like it had the whole thing. And I was like, uh, uh, you know, I crossed it all off and put in the right of first refusal clause. Good I was like, you. I can't even believe they were rude enough to try that. Well, that's, you know that's, I mean? a, that's, they, they're claiming your intellectual property. I mean, mm -hmm. that goes one step which further, correct. which is absolutely not correct. And in most, and, and actually in union contracts, and, and you know, you don't have to be a member of USA to look at a USA contract. And I'll be happy to send a USA contract to anybody. So at least you can see those clauses. But there is a separate clause about intellectual property that goes beyond the right of first refusal. So mm -hmm. that's why it's really wise to join the union and whenever you can do union gigs and use union contracts. Yeah, that's a good point, David. Anyone can go on, it's USA829.org. And under, I think it's under contracts, you can see all of them there. Yeah, you could copy them. You know, just copy those CBA. clauses. That's what it's under. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Anne brings up a good point, and it hits set designers and costume designers a lot more than we do. Uh, a small regional theater has you do, I don't know, Hello, Dolly. They want to own that thing forever Ugh. because they have a plan on turning that into rental stock. Right. Mm -hmm. Happens in opera, too. It happens in opera yeah. all the time. And I've had, you know, a lot of people who I uh, negotiate with, you know, they will say, oh, come on, David, really? And I said, yeah, really. I mean, yeah, really. <laughs> really, you know, and I had another student ask me yesterday. It was really interesting. She she said, well, um, must we have contracts for everything we do, even though yes. even though it's a friend of mine and he's putting together a yes. show, I'm getting paid two hundred dollars. Yes. And exactly yes. what Anne's saying, yes, yes, yes. yes. They said, but what <laughs> happens when they say, Oh, come on, Anne, we've been friends forever. You know Then you say no. Well <laughs> what, happens when, what happens when that show turns turns into rent? Right, exactly. Right? No, what you say, you what know? you say to, so you don't hurt anyone's feelings, you say, Listen, I said, Yes, we're friends. I said, This is business. This is the business mm -hmm. side, and we're still friends, and this is how mm -hmm. I do business. And if you say yes. it that way, hopefully with a better tone of voice than I just said it, <laughs> then people aren't going to get mad at you, and they're going to understand, well, you know, she's, she's a business person, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's well, how it's you also do an it. It's, it's an opportunity, isn't it, to, to learn how to make a contract and learn how to work that way. It's, it's, when you're young, it's a way to sort of expose yeah. yourself to that. Or are you going to wait till you're 40 to sort of figure out how contracts right. work? Right. It's, it's, it's a, a simple letter of agreement. Even if it's just something like, oh, I'm hiring you to, to design the show on this date, and I'm paying you so-and-so on that date. And you both sign it. It's an agreement. I mean, most of the time, nothing like this ever happens where, where they, they're going to rip mm -hmm. you off and you have to take them to court. But you know something? That's happened to me. And I've actually taken two producers to court. I may be working on my third producer <laughs> right now. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Well, I feel like we could do a whole show on contracts. Oh, you know, my and God. Right of first refusal is so important. I'd say I'm even starting to put, because you said the thing about sets and costumes, often they want to put their set in stock and use it again. I've started to put in my contracts about how they can't uh, send my plot or paperwork to anyone else. Absolutely. Because I've found that theaters have started to do that. Like, oh, yeah, just use the rep plot, you know, and then they're using my design as well. And. Um, and then recently, the same contract I was negotiating, I have a whole clause, as I'm sure all of you do, about protecting ourselves, right? It's the designer, I don't know the wording, but the designer is solely responsible for the artistic look of the piece and is not, you know, uh, responsible for the electrical inappropriateness oh, yeah. or, you know, it's that kind Structural of thing. So integrity. If the theater burns yeah. down, yeah. yeah. If the theater burns down, you can't sue me. And so well, I put are, that well, clause they can't. in there. Uh, and those, the are person, those, are, those are disclaimers, yeah. but it's important. Those are disclaimers. It's on every yes. bit of paperwork I do. The ones that I we do. don't, yeah. 
But I put that disclaimer in my contract because in episode three of Light Talk, That's right. Stan talked about that a lot. Thank you very much. And so I've been putting that in my contract ever since because it's always been on my light plot. Yeah, that's right. And I right. sent that to this guy and he said, uh, I'll put it in there. I don't see why you need it, but I'll put it in there. And I thought, oh, my God, yes, I need that. You know, so contracts are they're painful to negotiate sometimes, but they're so vital to get it right the first time. Yep. But one final thing, one final clause, then we're going to close out the show. Uh Always have in your contract the spa clause that you must have. <laughs> you must have time every day. I, I suggest four hours, but you know you can negotiate it to visit a spa, <laughs> and the show will look marvelous. I wish that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that Hammond organ solo in the background tells us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. Don't forget to visit our website at lighttalk.org. There you will find our complete schedule of interviews along with other upcoming lighting events. And be sure to follow us on Facebook on our ever-growing Light Talk Facebook group page. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast. That way you will never miss a second of Lumen Brother and Sister Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. In other words, even if you have great insurance, stop and think. <laughs> Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sista. Coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, San Clemente, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to tune in next week when we discuss low-profile footlights. Grad school, what question should I ask you? Great question, by the way. What are sea changers? And I need a really big hazer, baby. I need a tiny one. <laughs> All that and a new sponsor, Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around this world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye, Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.